Hey everybody, we're here. We're gonna go ahead and do our next chapter and I'm tired of running. This is chapter four. It is currently Thursday evening, but this will go live on the YouTube channel on Saturday. So you'll be seeing this on Saturday for the first time. Chapter four, I'm tired of running by Marlon Robinson on his way home. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him, his heart pounding. He ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. Luke 15, 20b through 21, the message. Twice a year, we, as a family, would pile into our vehicle and embark on a journey. This vehicle was in the early years, a station wagon, green with wood panels, that seemed at the time to be at least 60 feet long. I was the youngest of four children, which meant that I was to ride in the back of the Robinson wagon with all the luggage. As we got a little older and a little better off, we would trade in old Woody for a custom van with captain's chair, cup holders, and carpet. In this maj majestic motor vehicle, I would not be riding with the luggage, oh no. I would be stretched out on the thick, shag carpeted floor with a coloring book and crayons. It was a time of free roaming during the flight with not a seatbelt in sight. We were not tethered down with the worry of such trivial safety features. The destination of this biannual journey was to the great state of Alabama. You see, although I was born here in Alabama, when I was around the ripe young age of two, I was, as I like to say, taken out of the promised land and taken to a far off country called Oklahoma. Most of my family from my dad's side still resided in Alabama, so we would visit about twice a year for a week or so. I always loved visiting Alabama. This is the place that we were able to run through the woods, swim in the creek, fish in the pond, partake each morning of the world-famous delicacy known as Grandma Biscuits. And just to be the wild children that we always longed to be, this is where I learned to hunt, to fish, to shoot watermelon seeds at my brothers, and shell peas with my grandma. Although I love this place with all of my being, I hated the 16-hour trip with a passion. That is an eternity of time for a small boy with ADHD before anyone knew what that was. Let me tell you what I did love about the trip. My absolute favorite part of the trip was the last 600 feet of it. As we approached Grandma's house, we would turn off the highway where the Holiness Church and little Grandma's house was located. These 600 feet of beautiful red dirt was a driveway to Grandma and Grandpa's house. To eight-year-old Marlin, this was the most beautiful stretch of road in all the world. What made it so great was not that it meant the long, excruciating journey was over, although that was pretty great. No, what made this old, rutted, red dirt road so awesome to me was that as soon as we pulled off the highway and onto that path was that you could look down to the end of it between the tall pines trees that line the road and see a porch light with two silhouettes standing there waiting. No matter what time, day or night, that we would arrive, one thing was always certain without fail, Grandma and Grandpa would be looking, waiting, anticipating our arrival. They would always be there to welcome us home. This is the picture that always comes to mind when I read, when he was still a long way off, his father saw him. I don't want you to miss this. The father was looking, waiting, watching for his son. Now you may be thinking, it's not unusual for a father to be looking for his wayward son to come home, but I want you to realize something that didn't dawn on me until I had read this story multiple times. You see, this son was gone, not for days, not for a few weeks. His absence wasn't even counted in months, but years. He had been away from his home for a long time. It had been years since he had told his father, you're better off dead to me than alive. Years since he traveled down that same road away from his family, his life, his existence. By this time in the story, he had truly been dead to this family that raised him. Let's take a walk down these 600 feet of red dirt. 
that the prodigal now walks in nervous anticipation of what he is going to say to his father. Will he even be able to muster up the courage to speak to this man, whom he had betrayed, whose heart he had torn apart, whose name he no longer wanted to share? If you listen closely, you can hear this young, hungry, heartbroken man rehearse over and over again in a low, shaky whisper what he will say. Father, I'm so sorry. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I've wronged the whole family. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be numbered in this family anymore. He would continue, I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. Over and over he speaks these words as the tears run down his face that now looks 20 years older than it did just a few years ago while back home. As we make the turn down this road to home, he can't even look up for the shame, so you do it for him. What you see is odd, even startling. It's something you have never seen before in all your life. Just down the road, you make out a silhouette, a single silhouette, but it's not still. Oh no, it's moving. You nudge your sullen, traveling companion so that he looks up to see what you do. He does not at first, cannot lift his head. So you, you help him. You reach over gently. Place your hand under his chin and lift his tear-stained face toward home. What he sees he had never seen before, either. What you both now cannot take your eyes off of is the father running. Why is that so unusual, you might ask? You see, for an elderly man to run in this culture was extremely unusual and very humiliating. Aristotle writes simply that great men never run in public. As shocked as you both are, you are not imagining it. The father is running. I believe he is running because of the overwhelming compassion and love he had for his son. A little shame and embarrassment is of no consequence to him at this moment. His son, who was lost, who was in all accounts dead to the family, is now coming home. Let me offer another reason that I believe this father is running. In that culture, a Jewish son who lost his inheritance among Gentiles would have been subject to a ceremony on his return to the village called the Kezazah in which the villagers would have broken a large pot at his feet and yelled at him, telling him that he was now cut off from his people. So when the father runs, it's at least partly because he wants to reach the son before the rest of the village can get to him. This father is literally running to save his son. Instead of subjecting him to the utter shame of the Kezazah, he embraces him, shows the village that his son is forgiven, and then moves too quickly, restore him, through the killing of a fatted calf. But I'm getting ahead of myself. You may still be a long way off from the Father. If so, I've written this book to tell you that the Father sees you. Your Heavenly Father sees you. And His heart is pounding. He's running to you. He longs to kiss you, to embrace you. Stop looking toward the ground. Stop letting the weight of your guilt and the shame keep your eyes from seeing Him. Don't bother, don't bother rehearsing. What you are going to tell him, he already knows. He knows where you are, where you've been, what you said, what you've done, and even what you are thinking. Look up. With all that he already knows about you, he's still running, arms wide open, waiting to save you from your guilt, shame, situation, and your sin. Here he comes. That's chapter four of I'm Tired of Running by Marlon Robinson. Dear Heavenly Father, Father God, we thank you once again for this book, Lord, the the the, the parable, the, the ability you gave Marlon to be able to write it, Lord. Father God, we just thank you for always, always being there with arms wide open, Lord. We know no matter what we do, that you are there waiting for us to return. We know we need to repent whenever we stray that far, Lord. And but we know that as soon as we that you will just forgive us of that, Lord. We know it goes into the sea of forgetfulness. We know it is as far as the east is from the west, Lord. You forget it. I know that we never forget things here on earth in our flesh, Lord. I know that. 
I know we 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 remember we we don't forget, but you have forgot. You have forgiven, and you have forgotten. Now, as we are in our flesh, we will constantly battle that that fleshly instinct, that worldly instinct of where we always want to bring up to others the mistakes they've made or the wrongs they've done. When if we just follow what you teach us, we would forgive them of that and we would forget it. Father God, I know that we are not perfect here, Lord. We, I know we have our flesh, and I have mentioned that just a few moments ago. And I know that you live in us. You are in our spirit, Lord. I know that. Father God, whatever we do, we do with the Holy Spirit, with you. Three and one, one and three. The one in the middle died for me. Father God, and I thank you for allowing your son to come down. Be fully God and fully man. And going through everything we go through, living a perfect, sinless life, and then paying that ultimate price for all of our sins and for anybody who chooses to repent and believe upon Him. It takes a little more than just believing in the demons and the devil and the the messengers of Satan that buffeted Paul, they believe in him. They know him. And they know he is 100% real. And you are real. Father God, but it takes believing upon that sacrifice that he paid for us in the most agonizing and excruciating way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. He did not send him here to condemn it. You did not send him here to condemn the world. But you sent him here that so through him, we and us, the world, might be saved. It's a free gift you give. You don't renege. Father God, once we truly are repent and accept you as our Lord and Savior, we know that you do not, we cannot be snatched out of the Father's hands. We know that once we are truly saved and we are truly walking on that path, notice I'm saying truly. I don't believe it's as simple as just walking in aisle, signing a card and saying a prayer and getting in a baptismal dunking booth, Lord. I believe there has to be a change. I don't believe you can just do all the outwardly expressions to make it look good for your family members, but never have an, an inward change. I know, and I believe that's the difference between the whole belief of once saved, always saved. I believe, and I, I don't believe you have to get saved again and again and again, like the two different camps of Baptists believe in other denominations, Lord. I believe that once you are truly, truly saved, Lord, once you are a child of the King, your child, part of the body, part of the bride, that you will protect us, Lord. That doesn't change the fact that we may have consequences for our actions that you have forgiven us for you forgive us of the sins you do not relieve the consequences lord that's where you'll hear people constantly say a sin is a sin and not to pass judgment but here's the facts of the matter yes to you a sin is a sin if you if you fell one you fell them all but that's the flesh that was before jesus father god the differences in the sin, whether we take a candy bar or we commit a heinous, heinous act, is the consequences in our flesh here on earth. Those can be different, Lord. But we just thank you for the ability to know and the ability to have the faith in the fact that you forgive us of those. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We can never 
we can never do enough to thank you for that ultimate price you paid for us. Father God, I just pray for this country. You know its needs. You know where it's going. And I pray against what is the sacrifices happening to Molly, Lord. I pray against that at that convention going on in Chicago. And I just pray for you to just start working on some that are there, Lord. Just let them know the error of their ways if that is they're, that they're not mind blind to everything, Lord. And I pray for any of the Christians who think that kind of sacrifice is okay. Because that's what it is. That's a sacrifice to Malik. And we do not ever want to put any other gods before you. Because you are the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but through you. Father God, that has been on my heart. That this, It wasn't what I wanted this prayer to be like. But I'm talking to you, Lord. Please be with the people. Let them know there's another way. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. Father God, our heart just goes out. We know those innocent children will be returned to you. And they, they won't. But, man, I just can't even imagine. I can't even fathom it, Lord. The wickedness it takes to do that. But I love you, Lord, and I just pray for those. Every single one of them can be forgiven. They have time. So please, Lord, work on their heart. I know we're not allowed to pass judgment because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But Father God, we also know whenever you say something is horrific and a sin. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. All right, guys, that's the one for this week. My hair looks amazing, don't it? All right, looks better, right? Okay, I need a haircut. Man, they were so busy last weekend. Drove by multiple times, and every seat was full and standing room only. And on Saturdays, they're only open till 3 anyways. So, anyways, I love y'all. I'll see you soon. Uh, next chapter will be 5, I do believe. Let's look. Yes, 5. I just read 4. I should have known that. <laughs> Sorry, I worked all day. I'm a little tired. But you'll be seeing this on Saturday. Later.